optional get. My name is Erin Beasley. I'm the executive director for ecosystem restoration camps in the US. As you know, we're a movement and network of independent restoration initiatives around the world. And we host these fireside chats to learn a little bit more in depth about what's going on at each of our partners. Um, and today we have um, Leo Lachere, who I will introduce to you in a moment, who's joining us from EcoCamp Coyote. Um, we will also be joined by John D. Liu, who will talk a little bit about what's going on um, in some of the restoration sites that he's been visiting. He'll, he'll join us a little bit later, um, but I think we can go ahead and get started with the overview of what's going on with some news about what's happening in our camps um, and some general housekeeping. So as I mentioned, um, please keep your mute, uh, please mute your, your microphone um, until um, after Leo's presentation, we will have a participatory section at the end, and we'd love to hear from you then. Um, <clears throat> and please hold your questions until after his presentation as well. Um, you can ask your question either in person by raising your hand virtually or on your video, and um, you can also put your question in the chat if that's better for you. We'll first do um, a formal one-hour session to learn a little bit more about EcoCamp Coyote. And we'll have a question and answer session after Leo's presentation. And then we'll open it up um, for a general discussion where you can talk about um, projects that you're working on, additional questions that you might have, um, or anything else that you'd like to share. Before we get started, I wanna share a little bit about what's going on with camp experiences and courses that are coming up. Camp Green Pop in South Africa is hosting their Eden Festival of Action, which combines practical ecosystem work with a full lineup of workshops from October 2nd to the 9th. Camp Ember Embercombe in the UK will be hosting a rewilding camp experience from October 14th to 17th. Hi, John, I see you just joined us. Um, and I'll have you jump in after I do the, the camp news. Um, camp Tolego is in South Africa and they will be hosting an internationally recognized permaculture design course from November 16th to 19th. And last but not least, our featured guest today Eco Camp Coyote in California will be having a fall camp weekend in Morgan Hill from November 11th to 13th. And Leo can confirm those dates for you in his presentation. Oops. Quickly about camp news. Um, there are now 55 camps in our network, which is really exciting. So sometimes it's hard to keep up with all of the developments and all the amazing things that are happening there. Um, but some quick highlights. In Kenya, uh, Camp Mamba Mombasa Mangroves has partnered with Climate Partners to plant 750,000 mangrove trees. Sinaldo Valley in Brazil, and, uh, outside of Rio, is hosting um, or it has launched a, a crowdfunding campaign. You can find more about that on our website. Um, please support them. They're working to expand a women-led agroforestry enterprise that includes job training and job skills uh, for protection and restoration of the Mach Atlantica forest, or excuse me, the Mach Atlantica in Brazil. Um, and then in Italy, Camp Rocha Viva is working with ERC and Plant for the Planet to host a conference on the 27th of no September to present their new project, Magnus Lucas, which is a collaboration to build a green belt to stop land desertification and mitigate climate change. And finally, to celebrate a little bit about what all of this action has meant collectively, since we began this work in 2017, 
18,000 people have joined to participate in restoration, regeneration, and rehabilitation of over 8,800 hectares of land, which is just over 20,000 acres. And they've planted more than 2,300,000 trees and plants at 55 initiatives around the world. So, so nice to see all of this action and effort moving and growing. Um, and thank you for, for joining us here. I wanna hand it over to John to share some opening words about, um, about what he's been thinking about and, and visiting related to restoration. And when John closes, I will introduce uh, Leo. So please go ahead, John. Hello, everyone. It's so exciting. Can you hear me? Okay. Yeah. yeah. It's uh, my one o'clock in the morning, unfortunately. So I'm a little woozy. But uh, great to see lots of people I know and so glad you're all here. Um, I just wanted to tell you that uh, I, I was able to have a discussion with, um, it was on a panel discussion with um, Noam Chomsky um, two days ago. So if you'd like to take a look at that, I'm gonna, I think I'm at the best place, the best method might be to let you just look at some of the, some of the clips of that. So I'm, I'm going to put that into the, into the uh, chat a little bit later. Um, I think the things that I've been, if you, if you look at that, you'll notice that um, Noam Chomsky is really pretty um, worried. Uh, one, one of the things that I noticed about um, Noam Chomsky's work is that over the years, he's been consistently, I, I would say, right somehow in, in his thinking, but that it hasn't made him very happy. He's a really seriously sad individual, I think. And um, if you're really dedicated and watch the whole thing, at the very end, he sort of smiles, sort of, <laughs> barely. Um, and I, I really wish he could smile more. But um, I don't know how he's going to be able to do that exactly. But I was able to discuss um, what's happening a little bit with the camps movement. We did have, uh, it was, um, shown on a live stream with a group called uh, we don't have I, don't, I think it's called we don't have time something like time is running out or something like that and um and then there was another uh it's it's also being shown on vpro the public television network that uh that made green gold here in the Netherlands, Dutch public TV. Anyway, I was able to um, talk about what I've been thinking um, and in the kind of grim situation that, um, that Noam Chomsky talks about, He's he, he, he actually thinks that we have just that this particular time in the next few months is critical for the world because or for let's say for human civilization, because um, he, he thinks that there's so many stacked crises going on, which pretty much everybody can feel now. Um, and that uh, one, one of the one of the problems that we have, I think, is that all the 
all the people that are discussing this are talking about policy issues and about money. Um, and of course, <laughs> I, I've never seen policy or financial things. They, they take place pretty slowly and unfold. And I think what we really need to consider is that if he's right, <laughs> then um, ecosystem restoration camps may have not only this ability to help to restore ecological function at scale, but it might also be a question of survival for a lot of people around the world. So I wish it was a, you know, I'm, I'm really hoping as I get older that it'll all be great fun. But um, I think we're, we're in for a rocky road in, in the short term. And I've been thinking about what I think is the best way to deal with the short term and, and the long term. And I've, I've been working with people who are getting ready to set up central kitchens, creator spaces, and cultural stages. And I think this, this is kind of like a portal for a transition between um, this sort of conceptual human civilizational intention and a functional ecological world. Because let's face it, we have 43 people on this call and um, the Noam Chomsky thing did get into the hundreds of thousands of people checking it out uh, according to the digital statistics. But, you know, there are 8 billion people on the planet and you know, no, Noam's not wrong, I would say, about the scale of the problem. I'm, I'm hoping it's not quite as grim as he, he feels it is, but um, I think we're going to have to keep our spirits up uh, in, in, in case things really get worse. And that's what the, the most fun thing I've, I've had at going to camps is that People are having a, a good time in, in some of these places. And not only is it a good time, but it's making their landscapes more resilient and their communities stronger. And we're, we're, we can see very specific results in terms of if they go a bit longer um, I'm in a place right at the moment where for five generations, a biodynamic family has cared for a piece of land and it's been a drought conditions in the Netherlands, but here it's seven to 10 degrees cooler than in the, in, in, mo you know, two miles away, it, it will be stifling and it's moist and it's fertile and it's massively biodiverse. So there's tremendous amounts of physical evidence that it's possible to make ecosystems more resilient and more uh, in line with, with natural outcomes. And I, I'll, I'll, I'll also say this, it's a lot more interesting to be surrounded by all sorts of birds and insects and and small mammals and even in, in in when i was in california i was also encountering large mammals and it's that that's really fun it's it's kind of better 
than um, being in the, in abiotic situations. So I, I really hope that everybody will enjoy what Leo has to say, because I think he's doing a lot of things that we need to consider. He's using existing materials and upcycling and he's the 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 training at eco camp coyote is is really very special because it it's almost like a, a movie set in, in in the place where they are it's like a post-apocalyptic movie where where people are rallying around to to um to use what they have to make it better and I think this is maybe something that uh, a lot of places around the world are going to face pretty soon. And the more I look at the kind of postmodern architecture here in the Netherlands, I just keep thinking about what a thousand years from now archaeologists are going to be seeing when they come and they they look at this particular era in time. I mean, they're going to they're going to find all this wonky, strange ruins, and they'll they'll be excavating the um, the trash. They'll be looking at at the toxic trash layer that has been created by the last uh, few generations of people. But um, I think we're we're doing something which is critically important for ourselves and for our families and our communities and for future generations and and i'm i'm so glad that you guys are working on it and i hope that many many more will come on board to do this but um when we're doing this um i i believe we're we're doing what we're supposed to do at this time so thanks a lot. And I'm, I'm, it's one o'clock in the morning and I, I must say Aaron woke me up and I had set my alarm and I don't know what happened, but, <laughs> but my alarm either, I turned it off and went back to sleep. So I'm a little confused here, uh, but it's, it's great to be here and see you and uh, welcome. And I'm, I'm looking forward to hearing from Leo and I hope everybody will go and visit Eco Camp Coyote when they're in California, if they're in California. Thanks again. Um, I'm going to turn it over back to Aaron and let this go forward. And I'm going to put into the chat some links to, uh, to the, to the uh, Noam Chomsky thing. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, John, and thank you for waking up to be here with us. I know it's really late where you are right now, so it, it makes, um, we really appreciate you adjusting to the hour so that we can all um, hear from you and, and hear what you've been involved in. I'd like to now open the floor for Leo Lachere, who is the camp coordinator for Eco Camp Coyote in Morgan Hill, California. We'll have about 20 minutes, 20 to 30 minutes for Leo to share what they've been working on at Eco Camp Coyote. Um, and then we'll have time for questions and answers at the end. So Leo, the floor is yours. Um, please make sure to unmute yourself and share your screen. Thank you. Yay, thank you, Aaron. Oh, I'm so excited. This is gonna be the most thorough thing about EcoCamp Coyote I've ever done. Okay, well, let's see. Yeah, thank you. I'm Leo Lachere. I am camp host out here at EcoCamp Coyote. Um, let's see, what I'll be talking about today is kind of the who, what, where, when, and why of EcoCamp Coyote some of our, the ways that we do restoration, some of our projects, we'll talk about our events and 
a little bit looking into the future and what we would like this to evolve into and how people can get involved. Um, I'm hoping that the outcome of this is that we inspire some hope. You know, we're just regular folks over here and our attendees are regular folks. And I imagine most of the people on the call are regular folks. And so I'm just excited to, to all be in this community of people who care. So can we all see my screen, This our front gate here? Yes, go ahead. Thank you. So this is the front gate of Eco Camp Coyote. Eco Camp Coyote is a, a one acre property in the corner of a larger 10 acre property here in Coyote, California, which is in the South Silicon Valley area. Uh, it used to be a sod farm. So they grew people's lawns and then scraped them up, put them on a truck so people can desertify from the comfort of their home, you know? And uh, we're an off-grid prototype. We're an intentional community in training. Uh, we practice sociocracy. We live together. Right now there's four of us. My business partner, Arrow Gorski, Jake Gorski, Hannah Riley, and myself. And let's see. This is what it looked like when we got here. So it had been scraped, pillaged, plundered. It had been compacted. There's Boro the dog out there in the desert. And our camp is in the far corner, kind of forward and to the right. There I am with a crazy beard. There was nothing here. There was just gravel, fences. Here's some of the restoration that we do. So this little spot is right outside our gate. And this is an example of, we got a bunch of mushroom compost and a bunch of wood chips. That's what those piles are. And then those little antlers, people spreading out the mushroom compost. So we are trying to r restore the topsoil, um, undo the strategic desertification and, um, plant food producing trees and, and native plants. Here's a, a load of the mushroom compost. So we, we've had something like maybe 10 or more semi truck loads of this free mushroom compost. It's, there's a mushroom farm about a, two miles away. We've had probably, shoot, I bought a dump truck just to, just to get this stuff here. This is a bunch of wood chips. Here's folks at a camp out uh, along this little strip on the right where the tents are. We planted a bunch of trees, native plants there a couple of years ago. Here's uh, Dorje, Jonathan, who's from Camp Hotlum. He's on the call today. He was putting the finishing touches on this owl box and uh, the owls actually moved in. And so I'm very honored to be, uh, you know, uh, what do you call them? live with uh, owls, be like little roommates. Here's a, one of the trees, here's an almond tree. And so this is that same strip. This is this year, now, all these trees are big and a lot of them, I think all of them are producing fruit now and growing and it's just very exciting. Another type of restoration we do is we're addressing the the marginalized roadsides. So we're restoring roadsides. There's this mile and a half long strip. It's about five acres total um, along the road here outside of our spot. And the city was spraying poison. And, and so we said, all right, we'll take care of this. So we started picking up the garbage. This is us with a load of garbage. We start mowing the grass and trimming the trees so that the fire hazard was lower. That's why they were spraying it with poison. Here's Hana um, with the weed whacker. It's pretty simple, but it's hard work. So then once we trim the trees, here we are chipping, chipping it up. 
making free showers for the folks. This is a wood chip shower. Come to Eco Camp and you can have a wood chip shower. Another type of restoration that we do is around um, restoring uh, uh, fire ecologies and and the cultures that go with them. So here's Lee Klinger of Sudden Oak Life. And what, what he does, he's like a tree doctor. He's all about the oak trees. He's all about looking at the systems of the oak forests, which is the forests that, would, that are around here natively. And what do they need now that fire has been suppressed? for since colonialization. Um, so we work with Canyon Sayers Roods of Indian Canyon, and they are an indigenous person who still has access to the land that her ancestors have been on, you know, forever, which is an amazing thing. So, uh, a big part of our events is going out there and doing this fire mimicry of mimicking what would fire do when the indigenous folks were maintaining the land with fire and evolving with fire and having healthy relationships with, with low common uh, fire, how can we manually bring the forest back to a place where fire can come back to the land and not be this catastrophic thing. So one of the major ways we do that, here we are clearing brush, clearing brush and trimming trees is a big way. That's something fire would have done. We're adding minerals to the soil. Over here on the left, this brother is applying this, uh, this lime wash. So a big part of the, the the thing from fire not being around is that calcium is, is, isn't as available to the trees. So we manually apply it to these trees to help them along. And over on the far right, my little friend is brushing the moss and the lichens off of the tree, which would have been controlled by the fire and the smoke and actually are, are detrimental to the to the health of the tree when, aren't, when they aren't kept in check. Here's Lee taking out diseased flesh from the tree. So now that the calcium isn't there to create healthy bark, there's cracks, diseases and bugs get in there. So we carve it out, cauterize it with a flame and do some surgeries on the trees. And then of course, our follow-up event to that event is a fire like a burn day. So we'll take that brush that we cleared. This is a ring of fire that uh, Jonathan from Camp Hotlum brought with Thomas and they brought it down and we created a bunch of biochar with this kiln. It was amazing. So now this, this brush that would have been a problem is now part of the solution of bringing stable carbon back to the forest, healing the soil is just so exciting. Here we are putting, putting out the fire. It's a big part of um, making biochar and the smoke being all good for the trees here. And here's the crew here. So this was our camp out last fall. Okay, some of our projects. This is where it gets kind of juicy. Okay, good news with salvation. Arrow and I are partners. This is us on the cover of OSHA magazine. I'm just kidding. This is not at all OSHA. Don't forget I mentioned OSHA. Don't call them. Uh, so we reclaim wood for a living. Redwood fence boards. So, so check this out. They took the most ancient living organism on earth, multiple thousands of years old, redwood trees, 
cut them all down, almost 100% of all the redwoods along this coast that only grow along this coast, cut them all down. We're still clear cutting redwood to make fences, to divide people. And then when someone goes to get a new fence because you know they wanna sell the house or somebody's coming over for Thanksgiving or whatever, and they just replace the whole fence, the boards are fine. And so we take these boards that we're getting chipped, we're getting burnt in the power plant, we're going into the landfill and we, we have a business out of it. So it, here's more, we built this cool outhouse out of it. That's over there at Indian Canyon now. And it gets turned into this beautiful interior wall paneling that you see behind me. And it's, actually, it's available for sale if you're interested. Um, it's a beautiful thing to have on your wall in your home. I have a little pet project that I would love for this wood to just get turned into the most sacred use we could imagine, which to me was, I would love to be returned back to the earth in the box, in the reused flesh of these beautiful trees. So that's not what our business does, but it's something I, I built this casket for myself Any, anyhow. The Forest Factory, this is another project that we do. There's this greenhouse down the road uh, that we have access to. And the landowner said, when we start making money, we'll start paying rent. So we have not made any money doing this, <laughs> this tree nursery. Um, it's about an acre big of a greenhouse. It used to be, you can see on the left there, that it used to be a carnation factory, for lack of a better term. Uh, and here we are clearing it up and planting little baby plants in it and, and trying to be what we can of a hub for um, you know, the native oak species, chestnuts, figs. We did a workshop where we went and collected acorns. Here we are processing them. Here they are sprouting. It was so exciting. Here they are sprouting. Oh, it's like a takeover of the oak trees. I mean, th these are the trees around here. They need more of them. It's so exciting. Here they are. There's a bunch of loquat there and a bunch of chestnuts. Chestnuts are an awesome tree as well. Look at how big. These are the same trees in those other pictures. Now, granted, girlfriend Hannah here is petite, but these are huge trees. Anyhow, I, I get all excited about that. The food rescue is another little thing we do. I'll say a couple words about it. There's so much food waste that just goes into the dumpster, goes, we diesel fuel it up to the freaking landfill. It's crazy. So we take that from this grocery store. They give it to us. We used to have to rummage through the dumpster for it, um, but they give it to us now and we eat some of it. We take, we use it at events. We give it to the homeless shelter and we compost a lot of it because it, it belongs in the ground. You know, it, something, something better than putting it in a plastic bag. Okay. So John mentioned these, these kitchens that are needed. So a couple of years ago, some of the California camps got together and had a fundraiser and we built this mobile kitchen. So it's a little seven by 10 trailer that has all the innards in it for a kitchen. So we put this together and we use it at our events and it's still very much in the prototype phase, but we've used it at a few events now and it gets better every time. And the idea is that this would be a deployable kitchen that could feed 50 or more people off grid. It's, we want to use as minimal fossil fuels as we can to cook our food and, and support permaculture projects, ecosystem restoration. You know, there's so many times where you should be able to go out there and work on the land, but people got to eat and, and it's such a big thing to set up a kitchen. And so this thing has a water system, a power system, water filtration, it has cooking stuff, pots and pans and refrigeration and really it's, it's come a long way. Here's Willie. We use this uh, 
this Cobb pizza oven that we have on loan. So that's another way you can cook food without, here's some people eating at the thing. Here's Willie. So we have vegan pizza night, come to a camp out and we're gonna have pizza. It's free if you buy a ticket to come. <laughs> Let's see, this is this huge solar oven that we are borrowing from a friend. That's another way that we can cook without using fossil fuels. To give you some perspective, like look at, look at those tires. That's, that's a regular trailer tire. This thing is like 15 feet tall. It's huge. I mean, you could, you could climb there. There's a little baby one. So permastructure, this is a big thing. This kind of comes from permaculture. It's like permanent infrastructure. It's like, how could we have systems that really are based on renewables and prolific integration of energy and nutrients and water and all these cycles. So this is a big thing that we focus on here at our camp. This is our camp from the gate. So you can see front and center, we have a photovoltaic system that supplies our energy. Uh, the fire truck is there, we'll get to that. That's in front of that. We have a generator that runs on biodiesel. We have some biodiesel storage capacity. It's all very exciting. Here's one iteration of the innards of the solar system. We have this awesome bike generator that we put together from the folks over at Rock the Bike. So you pedal on this thing and it creates 110 power and you can charge your phone with it. You, you can charge the solar system with it. You can really kind of, uh, the thing it's really best for is figuring out how, <laughs> how much energy things take because you can't run much off of this. You know, you, you, you feel like a, little, like a little ant. You're just like, wow. You, you could pedal on there for days and you know run your computer for five minutes or it's maybe not that bad but we run a lot of things off of waste cooking oil and biodiesel so here's our generator on the left it's it runs on biodiesel there's my jetta on the right that i think i went all the way to new mexico on biodiesel uh way back so we have generators and the, the truck for the wood business. A lot of stuff here runs on biodiesel. Here's my old Mercedes running on some vegetable oil, some sesame oil. All right, some call it the John, some call it the Lou. We just call it the outhouse. This is our outhouse that is attached to a biodigester. So the first step in using this is hopefully the last person wash their hands. The gray water from the sink goes into the bucket under the drain. Then this toilet uses that water to flush into the bottom bag of this biodigester in which the little methanogenic bacteria break that stuff down and create methane and it gets caught in this upper bag. And we actually, so then you weight that bag down. Here's an example here of a, of a cute little weight, weighting one of these bags full of poop gas down. This is not animal cruelty. Here's me messing, this is the grossest thing I do by far. It's good to know. Um, Cause then we have to pump the stuff. There's kind of some stuff to it, but anyhow, Eventually that gas makes it into the kitchen. This is poop gas that you're seeing and it cooks food with the gas from the poop. Here is our rainwater catchment system. So here's an example of how these industrial scale hoop houses, in this case, we use this hoop house to keep the reclaimed wood dry. It can be heated with uh, gutters and this is going in, you can see through these white pipes, into these big old tanks that somebody gave us. And here it is, rainwater. We're working on, this is, <laughs> we're working on getting this integrated into our system to water the trees. Here's the fire truck. So this is one of our things. We like to be fire prepared. So we, we thought, 
we got to I just had this feeling like we got to we got to have something. We're in California. There's fires around us every year. We've had to stop events because of fires. They're along the road. We've had them on our property <clears throat> and we've gotten lucky. So we put this together and not was it two weeks later, there was a fire on our property just outside the gate on the way in. I mean, on the larger 10 acre. And so here's Jake. He's putting out the fire. I was driving around in the truck. It was, it was like, it was such a highlight. And we put out the fire before the fire department even got there. We had it under control. I'm glad they came, but it was, it was really, it was, it was a highlight of my year for sure. It was like, all right, I'm gonna listen to my gut, you know. Okay, events. This is one of the biggest things that we really do and care about. So here's us shipping off for the events. Uh, we pack up the truck. Sometimes we do them at our spot. <clears throat> and sometimes we do them, like I said, over at Indian Canyon, which is about 50 miles away. We've had about 10 of these events, something like twice or more a year since 2019. Um, we've had over 300 campers. And we really something we're good at is community accessibility. And if you can't pay, just come on. It, you know, it's not about that. It's got to kind of pay for itself, which is a whole thing, but just making sure everybody can come who wants to come. So, so learning ed and education is a big one. Here we are out, out here with Lee. We're taking notes like, ah, oh, curious is that a tree where he's teaching us about the fire mimicry thing and here we are exploring the pizza oven or the uh, sun oven look how big that thing is we could all fit in there it's huge awesome discussions i mean it's just something special about our camps is is the connection that you find with other people who care and here we are doing it and learning about it and like, oh, it's so, it's so good. Here we are just, just being a community, just, this is like during nap time, you know, together. Learning from Michelle, she taught us about zero waste. She was like, use this jar, you know, or whatever she was talking about. And then action, here's Gina, here we are on the roadside. This is one of the things that we do during our campouts, you know, getting the branches over to the chipper. Here we are planting trees. And you can see Lior had this, we brought the jackhammer out because the soil here is so compacted from decades of uh, you know, industrial ag. We put Johnny to work. He's from uh, Camp Birdhouse over in Hollywood. We said, you gotta wash some dishes, bro. Anyway, he looks like he's having a good time. And then fun, fun is a big part of the camp out. So we always have like an open mic around the fire and, and something, I, I didn't know how, quite how to say this, but there's just such a, there's also this reverend component that um, there's just this, this sacred thing that we're all there for, you know, like why do we come out to the camp and why do we, put all this effort in and and honor of the land and this this picture just kind of said it better than I than I can say it obviously here we are we're in the greenhouse this was at one of our first camps just enjoying and of course we eat awesome food at the camps with all we're trying more and more to not use any petroleum uh, last at our last camp, I think we fed all those people and we used like one thing of propane and at the next camp, I hope that it's none. Looking into the future, this is Coyote Valley. This is this is the larger area of where we are. And I just hope that we can restore more area and expand our programs. I love this picture of this little kid who came to a camp and he gets to play with fire in a good way. And 
we, we really wanna get kids involved and expand the programs to include kids. And then this is a, a picture that I found. It's kind of one of my visioning things is, you know, right now we're just, we just rent here and there's all this nonsense with the city and we don't know, you know, we don't expect to be able to stay at this place <clears throat> forever at this location. But one of our goals is to eventually own some land and be able to have a long-term, you know, um, a, a stewardship relationship with with some land. <clears throat> and I think that's something that really we all have in common um, and we're excited about. <laughs> My, my calls to action and, and ways people can get involved are you can donate, you know, if you can't come to a camp, you can help support it. That really, I mean, it's direct, like it helps other people come who can't pay and it helps it grow and it helps it work. So if you go to ecocampcoyote.org, you can donate there. You can follow us on Instagram. We're active on there. We're active on Facebook. We have a YouTube channel and you could buy a t-shirt, contact me. And most of all is just come to a camp out. Uh, I would love folks to come to a camp out. And my last thing here is to show this video. This was made by a dear friend of ours, Sean at Two Owls Productions. And um, he came to the, to the last camp out and recorded this and, and made this for us. So let's check it out. Wildfires are due to a, a lot more than just climate change and largely due to the fact that these forests haven't been tended. Oaks need tending. Doing nothing is not an option. We are here in Indian Canyon. This land has continuously been held and stewarded by indigenous peoples and it's where my ancestors have always been, where I'm very rooted and I'm part of community. We've been working with Sudden Oak Life and Indian Canyon to present this camp out and course on fire mimicry and traditional ecological knowledge. In essence, these are all forests that for thousands of years were actually tended, mainly with fire by the native peoples. The forests have changed dramatically. Fire is really critical for maintaining a, a balance in the forest. And then without fire, the forests now are getting overgrown, out of balance, and most importantly, much more susceptible to these catastrophic wildfires which we're seeing. The events that we put on are educational, action-oriented, and fun. People camping, got a mobile kitchen, activation, you got sudden oak life, tending and stewarding oak trees, initiating conversations and collaborations with indigenous communities, protecting ancestor trees. The land that benefits from these collaborators, these co-conspirators, these community members just coming and having a space to land, a space to work within, to be in community with, and inspire. We can do something on the ground level at community scales, and we can get so much done. This is the thing to do, and it, and it can be right here, right now. And it's the work that we have to be doing. There's really no choice. If we honor indigenous pedagogies, indigenous teachings, indigenous protocol, we can strategize sustainable futures. The beauty is, is that we have all the resources we need to address this problem. We really need to get out there and realize that everyone can do this work. Yay. Back to you, Aaron. Wow, thank you so much, Leo. Um, we don't do applause here, but if you guys are on your, um, if you're you know, on your Zoom and you would like to add a reaction, I think it would be really nice for Leo to be able to see back from you guys um, what you thought about his presentation. Um, you just shared such amazing projects that you're working on. It's really also 
motivating to see how many different types of projects you're able to incorporate. Wow, look at all these reactions coming in. <laughs> That's awesome. Thank you guys. Um, it's really cool to see also how many diverse types of projects you're able to take on, which I think is really special. Um, and, uh, and I think your partnerships are a really um, powerful piece of the work that you do. Um, so what I wanna do now is hand it over to the audience. Um, I have some questions for you, but at this phase, um, we really wanna hear from the group of people who are here. What would you like to know more about um, from Leo's work? Um, what do you want to, him to share a little bit more? Do you have questions, technical questions, questions about um, one of his programs um, or the way that they, that they do their work? Um, so if you have a question, um, please raise your hand and I'll recognize you and then, and then you can use your microphone and your video if you like. Um, if you'd like to also put a question in the chat, if that feels better to you, um, you can go ahead and do that as well. Um, or you can also raise your hand in the video. And if no one jumps in, I will start with one that I have. Oh, awesome. Um, yes, better world for all. Please go ahead. And just as a reminder, we'll be recording the question and answer section. Um, and then we'll close the recording and open an open discussion for everyone as well. Please go ahead. Hello. Thank you so much for all the work you're doing. It's uh, definitely what we need to do. Um, I'm in the US right now, but um, I work in Kenya and I plan on moving back there. And I really want to start a, uh, like an exhibition uh, location so that we can hold trainings um, for other people throughout Kenya. And I just wanted to see if you thought eco camps was a, a good way to get started on that. And if so, um, what, what resources or people or funding do you think uh, are necessary to get started? Thank you. Whoa. Uh, let's see. So was the was working with ERC helpful? And what are some of the necessary <clears throat> things that are needed in order to start is kind of how I heard that question. Um, let's see. Well, ERC ecosystem restoration camps helps a lot with with getting the word out and things like this and connecting to a community of people in this line of work and other camps. And that's been just phenomenal. And um, and it's, it's helped us kind of like legitimize, like what else would we call, I don't know what else we would be, just some like hippies, you know? So, it helps, uh, you know, I always say, yeah, we're an internationally recognized ecosystem restoration camp. So it, it, it helps and yeah, it's helped us with access to funding and things like that. And then, and we've done a lot on our own. You know, there's not like, like someone who's necessarily gonna, or like no one came in and was like, all right put the water tank there and like here's how to do an event and like things like that there there's been help and we've had to figure out a lot on our own and and good news wood salvation um has been i mean we couldn't have done it without the wood business you know um the the events until recently have cost us money to put on uh we've broke and then we started breaking even <laughs> so it's kind of like that um and like the solar system good news bought it and the biodigester and like all that stuff um has been the wood business um so it will take funding i mean it would have it feels like it's already going slow but it would go even even slower without 
spending a lot of our time on the wood business. So I hope that answers some of your questions. Thank you. Yeah, thanks. Thanks. Uh, thanks. I just wanted to see if um, uh, having a company that needs mushrooms from uh, waste, 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 waste city, city, city and then using the doing that. Um, I think we're having some sound, sound issues. So if Can folks who are not, not talking. talking could can you hear me? Their mic. Can I can I say something, Aaron? Go ahead, John. Go ahead, John. Yeah, um, I would just tell you that we have one camp um, that's working in uh, that's in Tanzania. It's the um, permaculture. Uh, they call it. What do they call? What, what's what's um, Main Springs? camp called over there what is it's it it's called Main Spring. Main Spring. well that's the foundation i think it's the permaculture institute of tanzania pit strange acronym but um they started as a as a um well like an orphanage and especially uh a girls school it's quite lovely and um, they they have a very successful foundation fundraising efforts in the United States for helping out in Tanzania and it's been going on for quite quite a long time and they train a lot of people in permaculture in Tanzania They've been working, I know, with um, Kenya and Rwanda and even even as far as Zambia and um, I, I don't think it was South Africa, but um, Malawi. And it's 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 there's a lot of help available. We also have one of the um, supervisory board members who's in Kenya now doing projects. And there's a, a number of camps in East Africa and other parts of Africa, which are also um, able to help out in, in communicating about what is possible. I would recommend talking to them, try to try to collaborate with Mainspring. Mainsprings is um, teaching the course in fundraising, by the way, um, which might be quite useful for people who really need funds to get going. So just a thought there. Absolutely. And for folks that are interested in learning about more about being an ecosystem restoration camp, oh, it looks like maybe my video has frozen. Okay. Um, you can check out a section of the ecosystem restoration camps dot org website and there's an explanation of everything you need to know there um, to get you started as well. I want to go back to some of the questions that we see coming through the chat. There's a lot coming in here. So I'm going to group a couple of um, questions from the chat. And if somebody would also like to ask a question in person, um, please go ahead and raise your hand and we'll get you in the queue. Um, so some questions that the audience has been asking is whether that large solar oven actually has some way to store or save all of that heat or is it is it gone once you close it up? Um, and where can we buy the redwood? Um, maybe we can have somebody put that information in the chat for people. Um, so that they can take that with them after. Um, from Sadia, how do you financially support yourselves for food and water if you're not generating profits? Um, so maybe some opportunity to talk about with the Redwood business, um, how that's connected. Um, so let's start with those three and then I'll ask another group. Sure. Uh, 
the website for good news for the redwood is goodnews.eco. There it is. Thank you, Arrow. Uh, the solar oven, let's see, does it have a way of storing the heat? It's quite insulated. It's fiberglass. It's got like a maybe an eight inch wall, I think is filled with foam or something. And it doesn't, other than that, it doesn't store the heat, but uh, it actually has a way because it was designed to be able to be used as a commercial oven for small, like for, for folks, um, how do I describe it? And basically you can supplement the heat with propane. There's this tube that goes through it so, so that, uh, you can ensure that the heat is high enough, you know, if a cloud goes in the sky or whatever. We've, we've never done that. We've never had a reason to, but um, anyhow. And then what was the other one, Aaron? Oh, how do we make money? So Arrow and I work, we do the wood business. Um, Hannah works with the wood business and Jay has a dog training business that he does for his income. So that's the four of us who live here and we contribute in different ways, um, but that's kind of the long and short of that. EcoCamp is, is a passion project. It's, it's hopefully won't always uh, just need money. It, you know, the point is for it to be able to, to create regenerative livelihoods um that hasn't gotten going yet so i'm gonna jump in with a question of my own and it's about um your partnerships leo i think that um eco camp coyote has a very special power in partnerships and getting people out to events getting people involved and, and feeling really excited and and um interested in coming back again and again. Um, and I think that that says a lot in a time where um, there's so many other things people could be working on, people have their own personal stuff that they're taking care of. Um, what do you think it is about what you're doing that, I mean, I have, I have some theories that I'll offer, I'll share mine too, but what do you think it is that, about what you're doing um, that, that builds that continued interest both from your partners, as well as the folks who come out to your event. And I say that, so I think there might be some other people um, on the call who are also doing organizing. Let's see, <clears throat> it's a good question. <clears throat> it would be a good thing for us to know. Why do people come back? I think it's, a, <laughs> it's a, to me, it's that we've created a community. You know, it, it feels kind of like we're creating the kind of thing that we would want to go to. And so mm -hmm. hopefully the kind of people who we are looking to attract would go to those things. And, and it's been the case. I mean, some of our great friends are folks who just found the event on Eventbrite and came. And now we're like buddies and like build stuff together and call each other on our birthdays and kind of that kind of thing. So I think the connection piece, you know, like we had some pictures of us sitting sitting around doing discussions. You know, I, I just really want to lean into like, you're not the only one who cares. You're not the only one who wants to do this work. That That's how I sometimes feel, you know, even been going to things like this and following who I do on Instagram and seeing the good things going on. It's like, at the end of the day, often we kind of end up doing it alone or whatever. So when you go to that event and you're all doing the same thing and you're like swapping in these conversations, like what's sacred to you? And like, what, what, you know, is it like rivers? Is that why you're doing it? Is it like earth or like babies or what, you know, it, it's like that depth that we just jump into and it's this immersive experience and it just kind of, gives people hope. It's like a little taste of what living in community could be without all the rigmarole of like, we'll, we'll, 
we'll figure it all out. Just come and like participate. You don't have to get into the weeds of making decisions together or blah, 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 you know, the hard stuff, so. Yeah. <clears throat> awesome. Um, we have a, a, a lot more questions in the in the in line here. Um, so we have questions about whether um, you're cooking with wood <clears throat> at Good News Wood. Um, we have. I'm going to ask you. I'm going to ask three to start. We'll, we'll keep doing a round of three. Um, could you share a resource for creating a biodigester? Seems like you guys have made one maybe um, by hand. And um, a question about your name. How did you come up with your name and why does it symbolize something to you? Great questions. Do we cook with wood, the biodigester and the name? We do cook with wood. I totally forgot to put that in the thing. We cook with a lot of wood. We heat with a lot of wood. You know, there's like, what, uh, seven dwellings on the land? We don't live here, but there's seven dwellings, whatever it is, however many. And I think all of them have wood stoves. <clears throat> so we use a lot of scrap from the wood business. Anything that isn't painted, it's kind of given me an excuse to hoard our garbage, which is a slippery slope. But yeah, we cook with wood. Uh, I'm really pushing to get the mobile kitchen off of propane and use a rocket stove for that. Um, some kind of supercharged little thing that is like trying to match the convenience of a propane stove, which is a pretty tall order. And, you know, chefs don't want to be like <laughs> blowing on a freaking finicky little <laughs> stove, you know? Um, so anyhow, there's, we, wood is awesome. Uh, uh, the biodigester, we did not build that biodigester. It's from a company called Home Biogas, which I put into the chat. And we bought it from them. They sell you the toilet. They sell you pretty much everything you need. Uh, it's a deal. I don't know why it isn't like, why they aren't everywhere. It's such a cool thing. It's finicky. I mean, it's like hashtag finicky, like just about everything else here. But this thing so freaking cool and the whole thing with the toilet and all that was like under a thousand bucks which is super reasonable and you know we would have been paying for a porta potty every month or whatever or at least at this spot uh and then the name uh the name came from you know we went to this convergence thing which was uh like, all right, let's bring the ecosystem restoration camps to California. And we had been living on this land for maybe a year at that point. And we wanted to do permaculture and we wanted to teach and we wanted to <clears throat> do good stuff. Uh, so we said, well, ecosystem restoration camps, close your ears, Aaron and John, like it's a mouthful you know so eco camp just sounded cool and kind of hip and like abbreviatory of that and then coyote is where we are we're in coyote valley which is this cool like and coyotes is just like arrow frames it really well he says like coyotes you know we're in the u.s and coyote is like a word for the folks who bring the the folks over the border and it's like this kind of like like let's go like this is kind of renegade we're just we're just going to do it we're going to get to the kind of like the promised land thing and i don't know that th that would be cool to be something like that of like holding people's hands across the the threshold of just starting and doing it so something like that thank you would anyone else like to ask their question in person? We do have a lot more questions, so um, I will jump into the list. Um, we have a question from Lasonia Luther too. Um, one about 
the process of your tree nursery. So a little bit about how you start your seeds, uh, how you start those trees from seeds and maybe a little more also about your collection process and where do those trees go, um, as well as, um, oh, I lost the second question. Oh, about fire mimicry. Can you explain a little bit more about what that, what that is? Okay, so the seed nursery, <clears throat> Uh, say it's an acorn. That's something that we're really trying. Or uh, actually, a chestnut is. They're pretty similar. They both. You collect them. You can do a float test. The ones that float are bad. Uh, you inspect them for bugs, and then you put them in a cold. Um, we put them in our refrigerator, like in a plastic bag, a damp environment that's cold, and that's called cold stratification. And it kind of mimics the winter, I suppose. And it it like it's just this nice little place for them to uh, for the seeds to know it's time to sprout, and they've got this nice little moist thing going on. So in the picture, there was like uh, perlite, and that helps to keep the. It's kind of like you could do it with sand too, and just moisten it. Then we once they're sprouting, we transplanted these into a uh, air pruning bed, which is like a planter box that's up off the ground and the bottom has like a mesh. <clears throat> instead of being solid or instead of interfacing with the ground, there's a mesh. So the radical, the taproot goes down and it hits the mesh and it doesn't, it's not going to grow into the air. So instead of just growing a hell long taproot, it, it puts that rooting energy laterally and like in theory makes a more like complex, like a more water harvesty kind of a root system. Some trees like that better than others. We just, we discovered that the oak trees, the, especially the live oaks don't like that at all. So that was like kind of a failure. We had a great germination rate and they grew really tall but they don't wanna be transplanted ever is like, is our experience. The chestnuts love it. They don't, they don't mind. You transplant them in the winter when they don't have any leaves. And so chestnuts are awesome. Uh, and then fire mimicry. So fire mimicry has basically five components or like five actions that we do. There's brush clearing, there's spreading minerals. Uh, there is removing excess mosses and lichens. There's applying the lime wash to the trunk of the tree, like a calcium rich lime wash. And then there's tree surgeries, which was where we you know, removed the diseased material from the trunk of a tree. I think that's all of them. Oh, and then there's compost tea, spreading compost tea around the the tree. So all these things are helping the kind of looking at the forest as having its own immune system larger than any one tree. And we're trying to support that. And almost all these things like the minerals and the brush clearing, all these things would happen with fire. And these trees are adapted to have fire come, come right up to them. But it's just that now that it's so overgrown because the folks came in and stopped the indigenous folks from being able to do this, now it's overgrown. And when these huge piles of brush that build up under the tre trees light on fire, they just take the whole tree with it. So um, now if we do all that brush clearing and all those things and keep the trees going along with the minerals and such, then hopefully when a fire comes, there's not this big pile of kindling under it to make it into a catastrophic fire. So that's a little more about fire mimicry. Thank you, Leah. It's so interesting to hear about like all the different aspects and I don't even know how you guys keep all of, you know, all of the information clear. Um, I see that there's a follow-up question um, from La Sonia Luther. Please go ahead. 
Um, yeah, I wanted to find out um, in regards to the um, fire mimicry where you were addressing the portion about removing the excess moss and lichens um, instead of burning it or um, I, I can't remember scraping it or whatever it was that you were doing. Um, have you ever considered making tinctures with that? Especially, I know the, um, that that's another way and lichens and moss um, in a holistic aspect of an herbal medicine is huge for health. And so if you have all that excess, instead of just getting rid of it, you could make herbal tinctures and make, um, use it in an herbalistic way. And then that gives you another, um, I guess, byproduct of, of helping to heal, yet recycling, restoring that and, and helping to heal people. Yeah, I love that idea. I, I am not really the herbalist of the bunch, so uh, I would love to learn more about that. I think that's a really cool idea. That would be awesome. Um, Thanks for bringing that. Uh, Hannah, you know, is a community member here and, and my girlfriend, and she's all, she's into herbalism. So we'll be talking uh -huh. about it. That's a good idea. Thank you. So Sonia, if there's a way um, that you would like the Eco Camp Coyote folks to get in touch with you, please feel free to put that in the chat so they can pick that up for, for their programs. Thank you. Um, I see also Jonathan from Hotlam Eco Regeneration Camp. Please go ahead, Jonathan. Welcome. Hello, Leo. Hey, brother. Hey, man. You know, Memorial Day weekend, half of our city burned down and several people died. You know that Hotlam Eco Regeneration Camp burned last year in a catastrophic fire. And six years ago, the other half of the town burned down. And I know that you're really resilient. And I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit about the psychological work that you're doing and how you're, you're bringing the resilience. You know, mm. I know that's a big part of your commitment with Indian Canyon, but I also know that you lead kind of a process around psychology. And I'm wondering how like sociocracy and your, and your lunch meetings, like how you support each other given that maybe it's gonna hit the fan. I was at your camp one time and we raced off to put a fire out down the road. Yeah. And I know you've had a fire right next door. So how do you, how do you, how do you be psychologically resilient? That's a cool question. Yeah, a big one. We've, so we practice sociocracy, like you mentioned. So sociocracy is like where uh, all the folks in our community can have their voices heard without having that hopefully be too lengthy or slow of a process of making decisions and etc. <clears throat> so in that we started doing um, kind of putting together what's our what's our clearing like how do we how do we interact with each other when things are when energy is weird and we have this uh like a we're putting together a, a, a conflict resolution thing uh kind of process um and a big part of that is using rc using reevaluation counseling which i learned from gaia Yu, who andrew and leora are here so that's like a co-counseling technique so that's huge that's like the permaculture therapy you know it's like we need to be able to say like, hey, I need a session, like this is a bummer uh, or whatever. There's so much around all the bummers that are, it's so easy to get caught up in it. And if we don't have a way to like discharge that energy. Um, so that, that's been going really well. There's kind of a combination in our little community of doing those RC sessions like back and forth and doing these relationship check-ins um just to like you know some of us we like work together and are romantic together and do eco camp together and it's like 
if we don't regularly, it's kind of, it's like the fire, you know, it's like, if you don't regularly burn that shit, it's going to be catastrophic when, when it goes up, you know, so pardon my mouth, but it's, it, you know, so this like regular, this regular release of the heat in a contained way is awesome, is the, I don't know about the way, it's, it's something that we've been really leaning into and feels really good. Um, we're going to have Della Duncan do some work around the work that reconnects at our next event in November. Oh, I don't know if I said the, enough of our next event in November 11th through the 13th at Indian Canyon. And so that's all about active hope and all about like how to cope with and not get overwhelmed with the, the collapse that we're kind of witnessing and how to like put action into our thing and do it together and what's it like to support each other. And we're much more likely to be able to cope with that if we're supporting each other. And, you know, I think that's a big part of what the camps are to each other as well. And, you know, this kind of bigger vision of a future where we're trading things and supporting each other and can share resources and things like that. So that's, and then I, I guess the, just the last part I'd say about that is this thing that Arrow and I have been vibing on for a long time, which is, we call it soul-centered agency. And it's like going to the deepest truest most pure intention of yourself and acting from that center rather than being like money centered or like pleasure centered or like you know being like soul centered and and going to that place where we are one with the earth and we can like act as agents and be in agency um, of that intention you know, so that that's kind of like what makes it all go around. So first thing we do at the camps is we all break off and I say like, all right, tell the other person in a session, like in this private thing, you're just going to get listened to like what's sacred to you. And people get to just like vibe on that and think about that. And, and like, what are some of the obstacles that are standing in the way of that? And like, oh, wow. And then like, well, what can you do about that? And like, what can you do? What can you not do to like, make that stop happening and eventually towards that coming to fruition and like goodness proliferating. So that's some thoughts about that. Great, thank you, Leo. Um, I have a, I, I wanna open some time for you to talk a little bit about um, the vision that you mentioned at the end of your presentation. Um, you guys have talked for some time that, that you're looking for a space or a place that might become more permanently a part of the land restoration and community activation and engagement work that you're doing. Um, and that net seems fairly large within perhaps the United States. So I was hoping maybe you could tell the group here just in case there's some like awesome synchronicity that might come out of that conversation about what um, that space looks for like for you, um, at least to start sort of the size, like is, is one acre okay? Is a hundred thousand acres okay? Um, and, and sort of region and, and if you um, have any other sense of what that might look like. Nice. I'm sure the uh, my other comrades from the community are like, oh, what's Leo going to say? Because it's a it's a thing that we're trying to figure out. You know, it's like it's so big, you can easily be like, oh, right. But we don't even have to stay in the U.S. Like we could go to Brazil. We could go, you know, so it's. Uh, but what what it seems to be gravitating towards is somewhere along this coast of the U.S., like. Upper California, Oregon, Washington is where we imagine gravitating towards. Um, 
and something in the 20 to 120 acre range. Um, and we're really looking to build a community at, at ultimately, you know, the big vision is to be able to do this work, maintain forest, uh, do all our things, not have to be under the, the thumb of the city. You know, we're getting inspected and it's like, I'm supposed to be living here and all that kind of nonsense. So, um, you know, water is a big part of that. And, and then it's, it's a big balance with like leaving, you know, I'm from here. I grew up 20 miles away. And so, uh, keeping that, keeping ties with this area and like, perhaps that's doing the thing at Indian Canyon. Um, and so we're working on it and I, I wish I could be like, here's the vision, but we're, um, it's been expanding and, and there's, there's different iterations, but, um, If that sounds similar to other people's thing, we're we're open and um, we're wor we're working on honing it and so, you know and building like what what does a member look like and what are our must haves and I mean actually we have a whole we have a whole like one pager thing about it that we've been been kind of going through different processes of of that of like how to build an intentional community from the ground up and taking courses and, you know, um, took courses in sociocracy, co courses in uh, the legal aspects of the whole thing. Like, how do you own it? Who's going to own it? Do you not own it? <clears throat> Anyhow, there's, <laughs> there are some questions to your question. <laughs> Awesome. Well, if folks who are listening to this, if that r resonates or brings some other resources um, that you have access to that might be able to move that vision forward um, with EcoCamp Coyote, co uh, with EcoCamp Coyote, um, yeah, please uh, get in contact with them and, and keep that conversation uh, moving because I'm, I'm just, I love the work you guys are doing, the scale that you're able of impact that you're able to do from one acre of land access is really amazing um, and your commitment and energy and passion that you put into these projects um, is so visible from from just knowing you even online and, and interacting digitally so um, I want to see if there's any other questions, and if not, we'll open, um, we'll close this session, part of the session, and we'll open um, the, the discussion part if people have news to share. Um, so before we um, close up, are there any additional questions that um, people want to give to Leo specifically on his pr presentation? So I think we can go ahead, um, we'll stop our recording and thank you all so much for coming out for the fireside chat. Um, and I will stop facilitating um, and just open the discussion for everyone, for everyone who would like who would to, like join, to in. join in. Um, um, yeah, so, yeah, so thank you so thank much, you so Leo, much for, your for your presentation. Yeah, thank yeah, you. Thank you.